So I'm going to give a, start off with a little quiz. Don't want you to yell out any names until I'm completely finished with the list. Was, was that clear? Okay. Listen to these words. You'll recognize this individual. It's a person. But don't, again, let me say, yell out his name until we're finished. Little John made Marion, Friar Tuck, Sherwood Forest, Sheriff of Nottingham, his merry men. We are talking about. Oh, come on, a little louder than that. Who? <laughs> Fact or fiction? <laughs> well, the, the story's told, and let me have your attention. And history confirms in the 1300s that King Richard I called the Lionheart had left England to do battle in the Middle East. While he was gone, his brother, Prince John, took over power, and he ruled over the people of England. This is the time frame of fact or fiction, Robin Hood. Prince John was a harsh ruler. He overworked, he overtaxed. He made people wear masks, get vaccinated, stay six feet away. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. But he was corrupt. And he erected, he erected barriers and castles and defenses to keep his brother from regaining power should he come back. But as Richard and his men arrived on the shores of England... They pushed through the borders, they pushed through the defenses with great ease, and as he made his way back to his throne, to his castle, people in villages and hamlets would, would ring the church bells and shout, the king is coming, the lion has returned, and so is the message of the book of Revelation. See, listen, the king is in control. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Jesus is on his way to rule and reign. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray together. Lord, we thank you that you're coming, that you are the lion. You are the one who is the king of all kings, and that you'll come back one day and establish your rule and your reign and there'll be great shalom upon the earth. There'll be as you intended it to be. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would open it to us today, that you would speak to us about, well, just about you, who you are and what you're accomplishing here and in our lives and that which is to come. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. Revelation chapter 1, we pick up in verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The setting, obviously, is this place called the island of Patmos, an island sitting out in the Aegean Sea. It's about 40 miles from the coast from the city of Ephesus. It's 10 miles long. It's only six miles wide. At this time, it's isolated. It's barren. It's got rocky hills. The highest is about 1,000 feet high. Uh, had the privilege of going there once. John is exiled there, and he, he says, he mentions some words here in verse 9, brother, companion, tribulation, kingdom, and patience. He calls himself a brother, a companion to those of the church. And the word brother basically here means that he's a, well, he's also a, a fellow believer, part of God's family. As companion, what that word basically means that he knows them personally. He's walked among them. He says, I'm, I'm your, your brother in the faith, 
I know you personally. But he also says the word tribulation. And day by day, this is a church that he's writing to and churches that he's reaching out to that are going through, well, they're going through a hard time. They're going through affliction, persecution, suffering. And they're with John seeking after God's kingdom and looking for his coming with patience, which means they're enduring, persevering against trials, temptations, and they're standing for the Lord. I, John, both your brother and your companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island called Patmos. And here's why he's there. He says he's there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John's been exiled to this island. He is there because of the word of God. He's there because of the testimony of Jesus. He's being persecuted by a crazed leader by the name of Domitian. He's exiled for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. John and others have made a stand. And, and this was a requirement in that day that you would call the Caesar Lord, like Nero is Lord, a Domitian is Lord. Well, they came out very strongly, the Christians did, and this is what the beginning of it. They would say, Jesus is Lord. It was very politically incorrect. And John obviously pushed it to the point where now he is, well, he's exiled to an island. This is not Maui. This is not some Caribbean retreat. This is not sandals in the Bahamas. It's a place of isolation. It's a place of imprisonment. It's a place of hardship. But it's also a place, and I want you to tune in. I want you to hear this part. It's also a place where John experiences great insight and revelation and personal understanding of who Jesus is. And I would submit to you that it was in exile that Jacob experienced God at Bethel in a way he never would have otherwise, where Elijah in a cave heard a still small voice, where Daniel saw the Ancient of Days, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace were given a revelation like never before. And here's the thing, maybe... Maybe you're on your own island of Patmos today. Maybe you're going through some circumstance and it's hard. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're in some kind of painful situation. Maybe your marriage is just falling apart. We certainly live in a culture today where that's rampant, where the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. Maybe you have an illness. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe you're parenting a prodigal. Maybe your business is in trouble or, or someone you trusted has hurt you. And I would say to that, that God can do great things on the island of Patmos, wherever you find yourself. Some of the greatest revelations happen in difficult, desperate times. Now, we don't want Patmos. We don't want the storm. We don't want the trial or the hardship or the loneliness. But the Apostle Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look what he said about his difficulties. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast, Paul says, in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in them, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is John's situation. I would submit to you that many times it's our situation. In the midst of Patmos, we have revelation and we also have, if you see here in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud, well, look what it says, 
voice as a trumpet. Now, now the Lord's Day, there's a lot of uh, kind of debate about what this is, if it's the actual day of the Lord when they would gather, which would be the first day of the week, Sunday for believers, could refer to the prophetic day of the Lord. But he heard a loud voice as a trumpet. And this is where the vision begins. This is where the Lord begins to reveal. This is where John begins to step into this, what the whole book of Revelation is about, and he hears this voice, it's, it's, it trumpets forth, and the symbolism, the idea here is that it's a voice of authority, it's overpowering, it's a commanding voice, it's the kind of voice that you stop dead in your tracks and you listen to. John says, I'm in my Patmos, I'm all alone, and suddenly, I, I, I'm, I'm in the spirit on the Lord's day, and, and there's a voice that's so loud and commanding and authoritative, and here's what the voice trumpets forth in verse 11. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Leo. We saw this same statement in verse 8 where we ended last week where Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And, and here's what's happening. God, through the Son, Jesus Christ, is making it very clear for John there on the island of Patmos that he's not alone and that God is in control. I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega. I'm in charge of everything. He's all powerful. He's there. He'll see you through. You're not alone on the island of Patmos. And, and when you see John write to the seven churches, he, he names all seven of them. And John was to take what the Lord had given him and give it to the church, to edify them, to, to, to build them up. This book, the book of Revelation, must be taught in the church. It's to edify the church. It's to build up our faith. Look, look at verse 12. He says, then, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Jesus is standing there in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, or as we see in verse 20, at the end of this chapter, he gives the interpretation of what they are. He says that the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, so there's not a big mystery about, well, what are these lampstands? They're the seven churches that he's just mentioned, and they represent the churches that John is writing to, and it says Jesus is in the middle of the candlesticks or the lampstands, the seven churches, and the idea is this, please listen, please tune in, that Jesus is the light in the midst of the church. He's the light of the world, and the church you and I are to hold him fast and hold him high and hold him into our culture and into our midst. Jesus stands in the midst, in the middle of the church. And that's where you and I, that's where the church receives its light and that's where we receive our truth. We receive it from Jesus Christ. He's the center of the church. And unless he is in the center place of the church, unless Jesus is kept there by you and I, well, the church has no light. It's that old saying, keep the main thing, the main thing. The main thing about the church of Jesus Christ is the message of Jesus Christ, which is the word of God. John 5 verse 39 tells us that you search the scriptures, and this is Jesus speaking, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Our goal as a church is to keep 
Jesus bright and light in the center of all that we do. We must make Jesus and the word of God central. That's why here at Coastline Calvary Chapel, we encourage and we support and, and, and we remind and, and we make sure that we read, that we study, that we teach, that we preach, that we live, that we honor God's word and Jesus Christ here in this building and outside of these walls. Amen. He, he stands in the midst. It's what it's all about. Let me just share a couple of verses. John 1, 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's Jesus. In, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has Shine. That's Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So here we have it in chapter 1. As we begin this, this amazing vision, he tells us very clearly. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, verse 13, one like the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Jesus in the midst, listen, giving the message himself. I'm the alpha, the omega. I'm in control. I'm, I'm A to Z. And John tries to describe this, this image that he, he says he has, a, he has a garment, a robe that, that goes down to his feet. It's a picture, if you will, of a, of a prophet in his robe. It's a picture of a priest in his robe. It's a, it's a picture of a king in his robe. And as a prophet, Jesus would proclaim the word, the word of God. As a priest, he would give access to God, make us acceptable in his sight. And as a king, he rules and reigns over all he protects, he provides. This, this is this, imagine, this is the image. I hear this trumpeting, sounding voice who declares that he's Alpha and Omega and he, he's standing there with this robe on and, and he, he's, he's, he's working all things together for the good to those who, who, who love and follow him. And that's why he's central in the church. He's the only one that can do that. His, his chest has this gold band across it. It resembles the breastplate, if you read in Exodus, of the high priest. It covers the heart. Jesus holds his church close to his heart. He, he loves the church. That's our theme of this. We got a sticker, in fact, that you can get out, out in the foyer. We got Jesus loves the church, and he's in the midst of it with a, with a priestly robe on and this band across his heart because he, he loves the church. He holds the church close to his heart. In Romans 8, we have this, this verse. Romans 8 says, For I am persuaded, and this is, this is because of Jesus, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there he is in the midst saying, I'm the alpha, I'm the omega, I'm the priest, I'm the prophet, I am your king and I hold you close to my heart. And it has this amazing uh, image, this vision that John has of Jesus and it says his head and his hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Now, when you think about this image, the robe and uh, the, the white hair, I don't want you to think of this. I don't want you to think of this right here, okay? <laughs> That's not Jesus. That's not the image you want to think of. You, you, you want to think of, of, of something totally different than that. It's like it says in Daniel 7, verse 9, when Daniel had, he said, I watched till the thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. This is the image that, that this is the one, the, his garment white as snow, his hair of his head was like pure wool, his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. This, this amazing image. Of course, John has only seen Jesus when he walked here upon earth. And now he's got this, this, this amazing 
appearance, eyes, it says, like a flame of fire. There's a lot of imagery that's coming forth in this appearance of Jesus Christ. He's got these penetrating, piercing, powerful eyes, and the image here is that, that he sees all, that he's everywhere. There's nothing hidden from him. All things are open to him. In fact, every motive of my heart and your heart, my thoughts, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is the image here. He's powerful. He's in the midst. He's a prophet. He's a priest. He's a king. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He, he's the Ancient of Days. And, and, he, and he sees, John has this vision, this encounter with the risen Christ and all his purity and all his power and all his authority. And he's describing it to us. And he says his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. These feet are strong and stable and, and able to, to, to bring to us and, and carry for us his forgiveness, his peace, his healing. And they're the feet also that tread down the enemies. They're the feet of dealing with injustice. Feet that are able to come to a rescue of his people. See, in John's day, in this letter, they're under extreme persecution. They're going through very difficult times. And John is describing this one who can come, who's got feet like brass. People in John's day are, are, are going through trials and his voice is like the sound of, of, of many waters, a giant waterfall. If you've ever been to a place with a huge waterfall, the, the roaring, cascading, thundering voice of great authority and power. This is the scene, this is the, the picture, if you will, that, that John is, is painting for us and what he is seeing, a voice with an amazing message. It's a message of hope, it's a message of salvation, a message of comfort, but it's also a voice that's thundering. It's also a voice that rebukes. It's a voice that will correct. It's a voice of judgment. And Jesus is about to, to speak to the churches. He's about to encourage and strengthen, but also correct and rebuke because he's a God of love. And, and you know and I know that if someone truly loves you, they'll tell you the truth about you. Not always fun. Not always easy. Some scriptures that, that speak about the voice of the Lord, like Psalm verse 29 says, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And this is what John's hearing. It's like a, he says, like a, 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 a waterfall in John chapter 5. It says, do not marvel this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. This is the voice John's hearing. This is the resurrected voice of Jesus Christ. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Then, of course, in Revelation chapter 3, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, the voice of the Lord. This is what John is hearing right now. And he says, he says it's, it's not some small, quiet voice now. It's a thundering voice. It's the voice like a giant waterfall and he holds verse 16 it tells us his hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength it tells us in verse 20 it gives us the interpretation of these stars it says the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands the seven stars are the angels of the seven church are the messengers, is what the word angels mean. Many commentators and scholars believe that he's talking about the elders or perhaps the pastors of those seven churches. He's standing in the midst, he's speaking to them, and he's speaking a word of truth that's powerful, 
and he's holding those leaders accountable. He's, he's, he's getting ready to, to call them to do what God's called them to do. He, he holds them. He, he chose them. He's, he's placed them. And John chapter 15, verse 16, he, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. God, through his son, Jesus Christ, has chosen these messengers, and now he's speaking to them in a, in a powerful way. And out of his mouth, you have a sharp, two-edged sword, his word, which is powerful, and it's true. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division and soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He speaks, just like he did in the very beginning. Let there be light, and there was light. This is the one that's standing there before John. His countenance is, is like the sun shining in its strength. I, I want you to imagine that here's John on this island. He, he's, he's going through exile and tribulation, and suddenly Jesus appears to him in all his majesty and all his brilliance and in all his glory. And John is overwhelmed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who was shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now imagine all that's transpired so far, and it tells us in verse 17, and when I saw him, I wonder if there was anything else going on. No, he says, I, I fell at his feet as dead. He, he, he just collapsed. The, the overpowering reality of Jesus Christ standing before him, well, he collapsed as a dead man. But he laid, this is a powerful verse right here, his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. He falls to the ground, much like the apostle Paul fell to the ground when, when Jesus when he saw a great light and heard a voice from heaven, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he fell, as it were, to the ground and he was blinded. But John tells us that Jesus reaches out his right hand and he touches him. He's not there to judge him. He's not there to consume him. He touches him and, and he gives him four specific things to do. And I want you to listen. Number one, he says, do not be afraid. He came to John to inform him, to commission him in this great letter to build up the churches. Not to be afraid of him, to, to bless and edify the church, to reach the lost through the church, to commission them to their, to their, to their task, to what they've been called to do. Perhaps... John thought of Isaiah 41.10, fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Jesus reached out his right hand, and he, and he touched John, and he said, fear not. Don't be afraid. I'm here not to overwhelm you. I, I, I've come to once again to commission you, and then the second thing he says, I am the first and the last. He's the beginning, once again. It's the third time he's talked about that. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. And, and, and I would say that he's saying this, not to just John, but to the churches and to you and I. He's saying this, I'm with you. I'm with you when you were born. I created you. Before you even came out of the womb, I knew you. I'm with you when you'll die. I'll be there. And all the time in between, and all through eternity, 
He, he, say, he says to John, you know, that, that, that I am the first and the last. Don't be afraid. I'm with you forever. What an amazing thing. He's with us. You know, yesterday my wife got a text. She comes into the living room. I was reading over some notes, and she's crying. I go, what? Because you never know what's going to happen, right? I go, what are you crying about? She goes, I got this text today from Vicky. We had just been in San Diego. I did a good friend's funeral. She said, I just wanted you to see these pictures. I said, I, I don't want to see it. She goes, no, yo, I don't want you to see it. I said, okay. And they had uh, cremated Pastor Ray, and they had, uh, I guess it was some kind of backhoe in their yard, and they had dug a big hole. They're putting ashes down there, and the rocks, everyone had written something on it, and they were planting a giant oak tree over his ashes. And I had made a statement in the funeral. I had said something like, Ray was like a tree planted by the water. He bore much, much fruit in this season, but he also endured many storms. And I think that the Lord is with you when you're born, when you die, and he's with you all through the middle stage as well. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. John, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to be afraid. And I want you to know I'm with you. And then in verse 18, he says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. There's what he's saying to John. John, I'm the same one that was with you. I'm the one that, that, that lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I'm, I'm the same one, John, that was, that was there when you laid your head on my chest when we took that last supper together, right before I was taken to the cross. John, it's me. I'm the one who, who, who spoke to you from the cross. John, here's your mother. Mother, here's John. It's me, John. I died for you. I rose from the dead. I ascended into heaven. I'm the one who lives forevermore to give you the way, the truth, and the life. John, it's Jesus. I'm your Lord and Savior. John, I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to know I'm with you. John, I want you to recognize and know that it's me. Fear not. I'm with you. I'm your Lord and Savior. He speaks these powerful things to John as he's about to, to reveal to him the messages for the churches. And then finally he says, the fourth thing, he says, I have the keys of Hades and death. He says, John, here I am. I conquered death. And I can deliver you from judgment. I have the keys to deliver people from the bondage of hell and death. He says, that's who I am. I am the one who sets the captive free. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, the rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. He says, John, I want you to know these four things. Fear not, I'm with you, I'm your Lord and Savior, and I have the keys to death and judgment. And there's, that's four things he wants you to know, four things he wants me to know. As we go through life, he's with us. He, he tells us to fear not over and over again through Scripture, that he's our Lord and Savior, and that he has the keys to deliver you from bondage. You know, we sing that song sometimes, I hear those chains breaking. And God continues all through our life to deliver us from different kinds of bondage that we allow ourselves to traffic in. He goes on in, in verse 19, write these things or write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place. John, I want you to write three things. Don't blow it, John. At least get this down. The things that he had seen, the vision, chapter 1 and 2, the things which are the state of condition of the church at that time, chapters 2 through 3, the visions, chapter 1 and 2, the state or condition of the church 
chapters 2 and 3, and the things that will take place, the condition of history and the glorious return of Jesus Christ in chapters 4 through 22. And that's where we'll be headed all through these three different segments. He gives the interpretation in that final verse, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lamp stands or candlesticks. Seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lamp stands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5, it says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So, so listen, we're almost done. As you think about this vision, this appearance of Jesus Christ, he's never been seen like this before. And he appears to John, and John is so freaked out, he falls down as a dead man. And the gracious, tender right hand of Jesus touches him and raises him up. He's all alone on the island of Patmos. And maybe once again today, you're going through an island of Patmos experience. And the Lord is reaching his hand out to you. And he's saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm with you from the beginning to the end. I'm Jesus, he says. The one who saved you and loved you and walks with you. And I have the keys to whatever kind of bondage or, or trial or situation that you're in. And I can open it up. I mean, and he's calling us as the church to allow him and to place him and to give him his rightful place in the very center of the church. That truth and light might shine forth. And that we be a part of that. That, that together we, we kind of, as we, as we read in the beginning of the message, we're to, to ring the bells. We're to shout the triumph that the king is in control. That the lion of the tribe of Judah is coming soon to rule and reign forever. And he's coming. I mean, I think the, the signs are everywhere in our world right now, and, and we're, we're stepping into the book of Revelation, and what we're seeing from the very beginning is one thing that must be true, one thing that must be central, one thing that must be, I think, on God's heart all the time is keep me in the center of your life. Recognize who I am. Don't be swayed by fear. Don't forget that I'm with you all the time. Don't forget I'm the Jesus who saved you and that I continually hold in my hand the keys to death and the grave, that you don't have to fear it, that you don't have to be afraid of it, and that you're never alone and that we are connected to the one who said this, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. That's our Savior, that's our Lord, and that's our Lion and our soon coming king.